Chapter Ten of Tales of Men and Ghosts by Edith Wharton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: The Letters, Part One. Up the long hill from the station at Saint Cloud, Lizzie West climbed in the cold spring sunshine. As she breasted the incline, she noticed the first waves of wisteria over the courtyard railings and the high lights of new foliage against the walls of ivy matted gardens. And she thought again, as she had thought a hundred times before, that she had never seen so beautiful a spring. She was on her way to the Deering's house, in a street near the hilltop, and every step was dear and familiar to her. She went there five times a week to teach little Juliet Deering, the daughter of Mr. Vincent Deering, the distinguished American artist. Juliet had been her pupil for two years, and day after day, during that time, Lizzie West had mounted the hill in all weathers, sometimes with her umbrella bent against a driving rain, sometimes with her frail cotton parasol unfurled beneath a fiery sun, sometimes with the snow soaking through her patched boots, or a bitter wind piercing her thin jacket, sometimes with the dust whirling about her and bleaching the flowers of the poor little hat that had to carry her through till next summer. At first the ascent had seemed tedious enough, and as dull as the trudge to her other lessons. Lizzie was not a heaven-sent teacher. She had no born zeal for her calling, and though she dealt kindly and dutifully with her pupils, she did not fly to them on winged feet. But one day something had happened to change the face of life, and since then the climb to the Deering house had seemed like a dream flight up a heavenly stairway. Her heart beat faster as she remembered it, no longer in a tumult of fright and self-reproach, but softly, peacefully, as if brooding over a possession that none could take from her. It was on a day of the previous October that she had stopped, after Juliet's lesson, to ask if she might speak to Juliet's papa. One had always to apply to Mr. Deering, if there was anything to be said about the lessons. Mrs. Deering lay on her lounge upstairs, reading greasy relays of dog-eared novels, the choice of which she left to the cook and the nurse, who were always fetching them for her from the cabinet de lecture, and it was understood in the house that she was not to be bothered about Juliet. Mr. Deering's interest in his daughter was fitful rather than consecutive, but at least he was approachable and listened sympathetically, if a little absently, stroking his long fair moustache, while Lizzie stated her difficulty, or put in her plea for maps or copy-books. Yes, yes, of course, whatever you think right, he would always assent, sometimes drawing a five-franc piece from his pocket and laying it carelessly on the table, or oftener saying, with his charming smile, Get what you please, and just put it on your account, you know. But this time Lizzie had not come to ask for maps or copy-books, or even to hint, in crimson misery, as once, poor soul, she had had to do, that Mr. Deering had overlooked her last little account, had probably not noticed that she had left it some two months earlier on a corner of his littered writing-table. That, hour had been bad enough, though he had done his best to make it easy to carry it off gallantly and gaily, but this was infinitely worse for she had come to complain of her pupil, to say that much as she loved little Juliet, it was useless, unless Mr. Deering could do something, to go on with the lessons. "'It wouldn't be honest. I should be robbing you. I'm not sure I haven't already,' she half laughed, through mounting tears, as she put her case. Little Juliet would not work, would not obey. Her poor, little, drifting existence floated aimlessly between the kitchen and the lingerie, and all the groping tendrils of her curiosity were fastened about the doings of the back stairs. It was the same kind of curiosity that Mrs. Deering, overhead in her drug-scented room, lavished on her dog-eared novels and on the society notes of the morning paper, but since Juliet's horizon was not yet wide enough to embrace these loftier objects, her interest was centred in the anecdotes that Celeste and Suzanne brought back from the market and the library. That these were not always of an edifying nature, the child's artless prattle too often betrayed, but unhappily they occupied her fancy to the complete exclusion of such nourishing items as dates and dynasties and the sources of the principal European rivers. At length the crisis became so acute 
that poor Lizzie felt herself bound to resign her charge, or to ask Mr. Deering's intervention, and for Juliet's sake she chose the harder alternative. It was hard to speak to him, not only because one hated still more to ascribe it to such vulgar causes, but because one blushed to bring them to the notice of a spirit engaged with higher things. Mr. Deering was very busy at the moment. He had a new picture on. And Lizzie entered the studio with a flutter of one profanely intruding on some sacred rite. She almost heard the rustle of the retreating wings as she approached. And then, and then, how differently it had all turned out! Perhaps it wouldn't have if she hadn't been such a goose. She who so seldom cried, so prided herself on a stoic control of her little twittering cageful of feelings. But if she had cried, it was because he had looked at her so kindly, so softly, and because she had nevertheless felt him so pained and shamed by what she said. The pain, of course, lay for both in the implication behind her words. In the one word they left unspoken. If little Juliet was as she was, it was because of the mother upstairs, the mother who had given her child her futile impulses, and grudged her the care that might have guided them. The wretched case so obviously revolved in its own vicious circle, that when Mr. Deering had murmured, Of course, if my wife were not an invalid, they both turned with a simultaneous spring to the flagrant bad example of Celeste and Suzanne, fastening on that with a mutual insistence that ended in his crying out, "'All the more, then, how can you leave her to them?' "'But if I do her no good,' Lizzie wailed, and it was then that when he took her hand and assured her gently, "'But you do, you do,' it was then that in the traditional phrase she broke down and her conventional protest quivered off into tears." "'You do me good at any rate. You make the house seem less like a desert,' she heard him say. And the next moment she felt herself drawn to him, and they kissed each other through her weeping. They kissed each other. There was the new fact. One does not, if one is a poor little teacher living in Madame Clopin's pension suisse at Passy, and if one has pretty brown hair and eyes that reach out trustfully to other eyes, one does not, under these common but defenceless conditions, arrive at the age of twenty-five without being now and then kissed, waylaid by a noisy student between two doors, surprised once by one's grey-bearded professor as one bent over the theme he was correcting. But these episodes, if they tarnish the surface, do not reach the heart. It is not the kiss endured, but the kiss returned, that lives, and Lizzie West's first kiss was for Vincent Deering. As she drew back from it, something new awoke in her, something deeper than the fright and the shame and the penitent thought of Mrs. Deering. A sleeping germ of life thrilled and unfolded, and started out blindly to seek the sun. She might have felt differently, perhaps, the shame and penitence might have prevailed, had she not known him so kind and tender, and guessed him so baffled, poor, and disappointed. She knew the failure of his married life, and she divined a corresponding failure in his artistic career. Lizzie, who had made her own faltering snatch at the same laurels, brought her thwarted proficiency to bear on the question of his pictures, which she judged to be extremely brilliant but suspected of having somehow failed to affirm their merit publicly. She understood that he had tasted an earlier moment of success, a mention, a medal, something official and tangible. Then the tide of publicity had somehow set the other way, and left him stranded in a noble isolation. It was extraordinary and unbelievable that anyone so naturally eminent and exceptional should have been subject to the same vulgar necessities that governed her own life should have known poverty and obscurity and indifference. But she gathered that this had been the case, and felt that it formed the miraculous link between them. For through what medium less revealing than that of shared misfortune would he ever have perceived so inconspicuous an object as herself? And she recalled now how gently his eyes had rested on her from the first, the grey eyes that might have seemed mocking if they had not been so gentle. She remembered how he had met her the first day, when Mrs. Deering's inevitable headache had prevented her from receiving the new teacher, and how his few questions had at once revealed his interest in the little, stranded compatriot, doomed to earn a precarious living so far from her native shore. 
Sweet as the moment of unburdening had been, she wondered afterward what had determined it, how she, so shy and sequestered, had found herself letting slip her whole poverty-stricken story, even to the avowal of the ineffectual artistic tendencies that had drawn her to Paris, and had then left her there to the dry task of tuition. She wondered at first, but she understood now. She understood everything after he had kissed her. It was simply because he was as kind as he was great. She thought of this now as she mounted the hill in the spring sunshine, and she thought of all that had happened since. The intervening months, as she looked back at them, were merged in a vast golden haze, through which, here and there, rose the outline of a shining island. The haze was the general enveloping sense of his love, and the shining islands were the days they had spent together. They had never kissed again under his own roof. Lizzie's professional honour had a keen edge, but she had been spared the vulgar necessity of making him feel it. It was of the essence of her fatality that he always understood when his failing to do so might have imperilled his hold on her. But her Thursdays and Sundays were free, and it soon became a habit to give them to him. She knew, for her peace of mind, only too much about pictures, and galleries and churches had been the one bright outlet from the greyness of her personal atmosphere. For poetry, too, and the other imaginative forms of literature, she had always felt more than she had hitherto had occasion to betray, and now all these folded sympathies shot out their tendrils to the light. Mr. Deering knew how to express with unmatched clearness and competence the thoughts that trembled in her mind. To talk with him was to soar up to the azure on the outspread wings of his intelligence, and look down dizzily yet distinctly on all the wonders and glories of the world. She was a little ashamed, sometimes, to find how few definite impressions she brought back from these flights. But that was doubtless because her heart beat so fast when he was near, and his smile made his words like a long quiver of light. Afterward, in quieter hours, fragments of their talk emerged in her memory with wondrous precision, every syllable as minutely chiselled as some of the delicate objects in crystal or ivory that he pointed out in the museums they frequented. It was always a puzzle to Lizzie that some of their hours should be so blurred and others so vivid. On the morning in question she was reliving all these memories with unusual distinctness, for it was a fortnight since she had seen her friend. Mrs. Deering, some six weeks previously, had gone to visit a relation at saint Raphael, and after she had been a month absent her husband and the little girl had joined her. Lizzie's adieu to Deering had been made on a rainy afternoon in the damp corridors of the aquarium at the Trocadero. She could not receive him at her own pension. That a teacher should be visited by the father of a pupil, especially when that father was still, as Madame Clopin said, si bien, was against that lady's austere Helvetian code. From Deering's first tentative hint of another solution, Lizzie had recoiled in a wild, unreasoned flurry of all her scruples. He took her no, 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 as he took all her twists and turns of conscience, with eyes half tender and half mocking, and an instant acquiescence which was the finest homage to the lady she felt he divined and honoured in her. So they continued to meet in museums and galleries, or to extend on fine days their explorations to the suburbs, where now and then, in the solitude of a grove or garden, the kiss renewed itself, fleeting, isolated, or prolonged in a shy, silent pressure of the hand. But on the day of his leave-taking the rain kept them under cover, and as they threaded the subterranean windings of the aquarium, and Lizzie looked unseeingly at the monstrous faces glaring at her through walls of glass, she felt like a poor drowned wretch at the bottom of the sea, with all her glancing sunlit memories rolling over her like the waves of its surface. You'll never see him again, never see him again, the waves boomed in her ears through his last words, and when she had said good-bye to him at the corner, and had scrambled, wet and shivering, into the passy omnibus, its great grinding wheels took up the derisive burden, never see him, never see him again. All that was only two weeks ago, and here she was, as happy as a lark, mounting the hill to his door in the spring sunshine. 
So weak a heart did not deserve such a radiant fate, and Lizzie said to herself that she would never again distrust her star. Section 2 The cracked bell tinkled sweetly through her heart, as she stood listening for the scamper of Juliet's feet. Juliet, anticipating the laggard Suzanne, almost always opened the door for her governess, not from any unnatural zeal to hasten the hour of her studies, but from the irrepressible desire to see what was going on in the street. But on this occasion Lizzie listened vainly for a step, and at length gave the bell another twitch. Doubtless some unusually absorbing incident had detained the child below stairs. Thus only could her absence be explained. A third ring produced no response, and Lizzie, full of dawning fears, drew back to look up at the shabby, blistered house. She saw that the studio shutters stood wide, and then noticed without surprise that Mrs. Deering's was still unopened. No doubt Mrs. Deering was resting after the fatigue of the journey. Instinctively Lizzie's eyes turned again to the studio, and as she looked she saw Deering at the window. He caught sight of her, and an instant later came to the door. He looked paler than usual, and she noticed that he wore a black coat. "'I rang and rang. Where is Juliet?' He looked at her gravely, almost solemnly. Then, without answering, he led her down the passage to the studio, and closed the door when she had entered. "'My wife is dead. She died suddenly ten days ago. Didn't you see it in the papers?' Lizzie, with a little cry, sank down on the rickety divan. She seldom saw a newspaper, since she could not afford one for her own perusal, and those supplied to the pension Clopin were usually in the hands of its more privileged lodgers till long after the hour when she set out on her morning round. "'No, I didn't see it,' she stammered. Deering was silent. He stood a little way off, twisting an unlit cigarette in his hand, and looking down at her with a gaze that was both hesitating and constrained. She, too, felt the constraint of the situation, the impossibility of finding words that, after what had passed between them, should seem neither false nor heartless. And at last she exclaimed, standing up, "'Poor little Juliet! Can't I go to her?' "'Juliet is not here. I left her at saint Raphael with the relations with whom my wife was staying.' "'Oh!' Lizzie murmured, feeling vaguely that this added to the difficulty of the moment. How differently she had pictured their meeting! "'I'm so, so sorry for her,' she faltered out. Deering made no reply, but turning on his heel, walked the length of the studio, and then halted vaguely before the picture on the easel. It was the landscape he had begun the previous autumn, with the intention of sending it to the salon that spring. But it was still unfinished seemed, indeed, hardly more advanced than on the fateful October day, when Lizzie, standing before it for the first time, had confessed her inability to deal with Juliet. Perhaps the same thought struck its creator, for he broke into a dry laugh, and turned from the easel with a shrug. Under his protracted silence, Lizzie roused herself to the fact that since her pupil was absent, there was no reason for her remaining any longer and as Deering again moved toward her, she said with an effort, "'I'll go, then. You'll send for me when she comes back?' Deering still hesitated, tormenting the cigarette between his fingers. "'She's not coming back. Not at present.' Lizzie heard him with a drop of the heart. Was everything to be changed in their lives? But, of course, how could she have dreamed it would be otherwise? She could only stupidly repeat, "'Not coming back? Not this spring?' Probably not, since our friends are so good as to keep her. The fact is, I've got to go to America. My wife left a little property, a few pennies that I must go and see to, for the child. Lizzie stood before him, a cold knife in her breast. I see, I see, she reiterated, feeling all the while that she strained her eyes into impenetrable blackness. It's a nuisance having to pull up stakes, he went on, with a fretful glance about the studio. She lifted her eyes slowly to his face. "'Shall you be gone long?' she took courage to ask. "'There again, I can't tell. It's all so frightfully mixed up.' He met her look for an incredibly long, strange moment. "'I hate to go,' he murmured as if to himself. 
Lizzie felt a rush of moisture to her lashes, and the old familiar wave of weakness at her heart. She raised her hand to her face with an instinctive gesture, and as she did so he held out his arms. "'Come here, Lizzie,' he said. And she went, went with a sweet, wild throb of liberation, with a sense that at last the house was his, that she was his if he wanted her, that never again would that silent, rebuking presence in the room above constrain and shame her rapture. He pushed back her veil and covered her face with kisses. "'Don't cry, you little goose,' he said. Section 3 that they must see each other again before his departure, in some place less exposed than their usual haunts, was as clear to Lizzie as it appeared to be to Deering. His expressing the wish seemed, indeed, the sweetest testimony to the quality of his feeling, since, in the first weeks of the most perfunctory widowerhood, a man of his stamp is presumed to abstain from light adventures. If, then, at such a moment, he wished so much to be quietly and gravely with her, it could only be for reasons she did not call by name, but of which she felt the sacred tremor in her heart, and it would have seemed incredibly vain and vulgar to put forward, at such a crisis, the conventional objections by means of which such little exposed existences defend the treasure of their freshness. In such a mood as this, one may descend from the passy omnibus at the corner of the Pont de la Concorde. She had not let him fetch her in a cab with a sense of dedication almost solemn, and may advance to beat one's fate in the shape of a gentleman of melancholy elegance, with an auto-taxi at his call, as one has advanced to the altar-steps in some girlish bridal vision. Even the experienced waiter ushering them into an upper room of the quiet restaurant on the Seine could hardly have supposed their quest for seclusion to be based on sentimental motives, so soberly did Deering give his orders, while his companion sat small and grave at his side. She did not, indeed, mean to let her private pang obscure their hour together. She was already learning that Deering shrank from sadness. He should see that she had courage and gaiety to face their coming separation, and yet give herself meanwhile to this completer nearness. But she waited, as always for him, to strike the opening note. Looking back at it later, she wondered at the mild suavity of the hour. Her heart was unversed in happiness, but he had found the tone to lull her apprehensions and make her trust her fate for any golden wonder. Deepest of all, he gave her the sense of something tacit and confirmed between them, as if his tenderness were a habit of the heart, hardly needing the support of outward proof. Such proof as he offered came, therefore, as a kind of crowning luxury, the flower of a profoundly rooted sentiment, and here again the instinctive reserves and defences would have seemed to vulgarise what his trust ennobled. But if all the tender casuistries of her heart were at his service, he took no grave advantage of them. Even when they sat alone after dinner, with the lights of the river trembling through their one low window, and the vast rumour of Paris enclosing them in a heart of silence, he seemed, as much as herself, under the spell of hallowing influences. She felt it most of all as she yielded to the arm he presently put about her, to the long caress he laid on her lips and eyes. Not a word or gesture missed the note of quiet union, or cast a doubt, in retrospect, on the pact they sealed with their last look. The pact, as she reviewed it through a sleepless night, seemed to have consisted mainly, on his part, in pleadings for full and frequent news of her, on hers in the assurance that it should be given as often as he asked it. She had felt an intense desire not to betray an undue eagerness, any crude desire to affirm and define her hold on him. Her life had given her a certain acquaintance with the arts of defence. Girls in her situation were commonly supposed to know them all, and to use them as occasion called. But Lizzie's very need of them had intensified her disdain. Just because she was so poor, and had always materially so to count her change and calculate her margin, she would at least know the joy of emotional prodigality, would give her heart as recklessly as the rich their millions. She was sure now that Deering loved her, and if he had seized the occasion of their farewell, to give her some definitely worded sign of his feeling, if, more plainly, he had asked her to marry him, 
His doing so would have seemed less like a proof of his sincerity than of his suspecting in her the need of a verbal warrant. That he had abstained seemed to show that he trusted her as she trusted him, and that they were one most of all in this deep security of understanding. She had tried to make him divine all this in the chariness of her promise to write. She would write, of course she would. But he would be busy, preoccupied on the move. It was for him to let her know when he wished a word, to spare her the embarrassment of ill-timed intrusions. Intrusions? He had smiled the word away. You can't well intrude, my darling, on a heart where you're already established to the complete exclusion of other lodgers. And then taking her hands and looking up from them into her happy, dizzy eyes. You don't know much about being in love, do you, Lizzie? He laughingly ended. It seemed easy enough to reject this imputation in a kiss, but she wondered afterward if she had not deserved it. Was she really cold and conventional, and did other women give more richly and recklessly? She found that it was possible to turn about every one of her reserves and delicacies so that they looked like selfish scruples and petty pruderies, and at this game she came in time to exhaust all the resources of an overabundant casuistry. Meanwhile, the first days after Deering's departure wore a soft, refracted light, like the radiance lingering after sunset. He, at any rate, was taxable with no reserves, no calculations, and his letters of farewell from train and steamer filled her with long murmurs and echoes of his presence. How he loved her, how he loved her, and how he knew how to tell her so. She was not sure of possessing the same aptitude. Unused to the expression of personal emotion, she fluctuated between the impulse to pour out all she felt, and the fear lest her extravagance should amuse or even bore him. She never lost the sense that what was to her the central crisis of experience must be a mere episode in a life so predestined as his to romantic accidents. All that she felt and said would be subjected to the test of comparison with what others had already given him. From all quarters of the globe she saw passionate missives winging their way toward Deering, for whom her poor little swallow flight of devotion could certainly not make a summer. But such moments were succeeded by others, in which she raised her head, and dared inwardly to affirm her conviction that no woman had ever loved him just as she had, and that none, therefore, had probably found just such things to say to him and this conviction strengthened the other, less solidly based belief, that he also, for the same reason, had found new accents to express his tenderness, and that the three letters she wore all day in her shabby blouse, and hid all night beneath her pillow, surpassed not only in beauty, but in quality, all that he had ever penned for other eyes. They gave her, at any rate, during the weeks that she wore them on her heart, sensations even more complex and delicate than Deering's actual presence had ever occasioned. To be with him was always like breasting a bright rough sea that blinded while it buoyed her, but his letters formed a still pool of contemplation, above which she could bend and see the reflection of the sky, and the myriad movements of life that flitted and gleamed below the surface. The wealth of his hidden life, that was what most surprised her. It was incredible to her now that she had had no inkling of it, but had kept on blindly along the narrow track of habit, like a traveller climbing a road in a fog, who suddenly finds himself on a sunlit crag between blue leagues of sky and dizzy depths of valley. There were wild hours when she longed to cry out to them what one saw from the summit, and hours of tremulous abasement when she asked herself why her happy feet had been guided there, while others, no doubt as worthy, stumbled and blundered in obscurity. She felt, in particular, a sudden urgent pity for the two or three other girls at Madame Clopin's, girls older, duller, less alive than she, and by that very token more appealingly flung upon her sympathy. Would they ever know? Had they ever known? Those were the questions that haunted her, as she crossed her companions on the stairs, faced them at the dinner-table, and listened to their poor, pining talk in the dim-lit, slippery-seated salon. One of the girls was Swiss, the other English, 
The third, Andorra Macy, was a young lady from the southern states, who was studying French with the ultimate object of imparting it to the inmates of a girls' school at Macon, Georgia. Andorra Macy was pale, faded, immature. She had a drooping southern accent, and a manner which fluctuated between arch audacity and fits of panicky hauteur. She yearned to be admired and feared to be insulted, and yet seemed tragically conscious that she was destined to miss both these extremes of sensation, or to enjoy them only at second hand in the experiences of her more privileged friends. It was perhaps for this reason that she took a wistful interest in Lizzie, who had shrunk from her at first as the depressing image of her own probable future, but to whom she had now suddenly become an object of sentimental pity. Section 4 Miss Macy's room was next to Miss West's, and the Southerners knock off an appeal to Lizzie's hospitality when Madame Clopin's early curfew had driven her boarders from the salon. It sounded thus one evening just as Lizzie, tired from an unusually long day of tuition, was in the act of removing her dress. She was in too indulgent a mood to withhold her, come in, and as Miss Macy crossed the threshold, Lizzie felt that Vincent Deering's first letter, the letter from the train, had slipped from her loosened bodice to the floor. Miss Macy, as promptly noting the fact, darted forward to recover the letter. Lizzie stooped also, fiercely jealous of her touch. But the other reached the precious paper first, and as she seized it, Lizzie knew that she had seen whence it fell, and was weaving round the incident a rapid web of romance. Lizzie blushed with annoyance. It's too stupid having no pockets. If one gets a letter as she is going out in the morning, she has to carry it in her blouse all day. Miss Macy looked at her with swimming eyes. "'It's warm from your heart,' she breathed, reluctantly yielding up the missive. Lizzie laughed, for she knew better. She knew it was the letter that had warmed her heart. Poor Andorra Macy! She would never know. Her bleak bosom would never take fire from such a contact. Lizzie looked at her with kind eyes, secretly chafing at the injustice of fate. The next evening, on her return home, she found Andorra hovering in the entrance hall. "'I thought you'd like me to put this in your own hand,' Miss Macy whispered significantly, pressing a letter upon Lizzie. "'I couldn't bear to see it lying on the table with the others.' It was Deering's letter from the steamer. Lizzie blushed to the forehead, but without resenting Andorra's divination. She could not have breathed a word of her bliss, but she was not altogether sorry to have it guessed, and pity for Andorra's destitution yielded to the pleasure of using it as a mirror for her own abundance. Deering wrote again on reaching New York, a long, fond, dissatisfied letter, vague in its indication of his own projects, specific in the expression of his love. Lizzie brooded over every syllable of it till they formed the undercurrent of all her waking thoughts, and murmured through her midnight dreams, but she would have been happier if they had shed some definite light on the future. That would come, no doubt, when he had had time to look about and get his bearings. She counted up the days that must elapse before she received his next letter, and stole down early to peep at the papers, and learn when the next American mail was due. At length the happy day arrived, and she hurried distractedly through the day's work, trying to conceal her impatience by the endearments she bestowed upon her pupils. It was easier, in her present mood, to kiss them than to keep them at their grammars. That evening, on Madame Clopin's threshold, her heart beat so wildly that she had to lean a moment against the doorpost before entering. But on the hall table, where the letters lay, there was none for her. She went over them with a feverish hand, her heart dropping down and down, as she had sometimes fallen down an endless stairway in a dream, the very same stairway up which she had seemed to fly when she climbed the long hill to Deering's door. Then it suddenly struck her that Andorra might have found and secreted her letter, and with a spring she was on the actual stairs and rattling Miss Macy's door-handle. "'You've a letter for me, haven't you?' she panted. Miss Macy, turning from the toilet-table, enclosed her in attenuated arms. "'Oh, darling, did you expect one to-day?' "'Do give it to me,' Lizzie pleaded with burning eyes. "'But I haven't any. There hasn't been a sign of a letter for you.' 
"'I know there is. There must be,' Lizzie persisted, stamping her foot. "'But, dearest, I've watched for you, and there's been nothing, absolutely nothing.' Day after day, for the ensuing weeks, the same scene reenacted itself, with endless variations. Lizzie, after the first sharp spasm of disappointment, made no effort to conceal her anxiety from Miss Macy, and the fond Andorra was charged to keep a vigilant eye upon the postman's coming, and to spy on the bonne for possible negligence or perfidy. But these elaborate precautions remained fruitless, and no letter from Deering came. During the first fortnight of silence, Lizzie exhausted all the ingenuities of explanation. She marvelled afterward at the reasons she had found for Deering silence. There were moments when she almost argued herself into thinking it more natural than his continuing to write. There was only one reason which her intelligence consistently rejected, and that was the possibility that he had forgotten her, that the whole episode had faded from his mind like a breath from a mirror. From that she resolutely turned her thoughts, aware that if she suffered herself to contemplate it, the motive power of life would fail and she would no longer understand why she rose up in the morning or lay down at night. If she had had leisure to indulge her anguish, she might have been unable to keep such speculations at bay. But she had to be up and working, the blanchisseuse had to be paid, and Madame Clopin's weekly bill, and all the little extras that even her frugal habits had to reckon with. And in the depths of her thought dwelt the dogging fear of illness and incapacity, goading her to work while she could. She hardly remembered the time when she had been without that fear. It was second nature now, and it kept her on her feet when other incentives might have failed. In the blankness of her misery she felt no dread of death, but the horror of being ill and dependent was in her blood. In the first weeks of silence she wrote again and again to Deering, entreating him for a word, for a mere sign of life. From the first she had shrunk from seeming to assert any claim on his future, yet in her aching bewilderment she now charged herself with having been too possessive, too exacting in her tone. She told herself that his fastidiousness shrank from any but a light touch, and that hers had not been light enough. She should have kept to the character of the little friend, the artless consciousness in which tormented genius may find an escape from its complexities and instead she had dramatized their relation, exaggerated her own part in it, presumed, forsooth, to share the front of the stage with him, instead of being content to serve as scenery or chorus. But though to herself she admitted, and even insisted on, the episodical nature of the experience, on the fact that for Deering it could be no more than an incident, she was still convinced that his sentiment for her, however fugitive, had been genuine. His had not been the attitude of the unscrupulous male seeking a vulgar advantage. For a moment he had really needed her, and if he was silent now, it was perhaps because he feared that she had mistaken the nature of the need, and built vain hopes on its possible duration. It was of the very essence of Lizzie's devotion that it sought instinctively for the larger freedom of its object. She could not conceive of love under any form of exaction or compulsion. To make this clear to Deering became an overwhelming need, and in a last short letter she explicitly freed him from whatever sentimental obligation its predecessors might have seemed to impose. In this studied communication she playfully accused herself of having unwittingly sentimentalized their relation, affirming in self-defense a retrospective astuteness, a sense of the impermanence of the tenderer sentiments, that almost put Deering in the fatuous position of having mistaken coquetry for surrender. And she ended gracefully with a plea for the continuance of the friendly regard which she had always understood to be the basis of their sympathy. The document, when completed, seemed to her worthy of what she conceived to be Deering's conception of a woman of the world, and she found a spectral satisfaction in the thought of making her final appearance before him in that distinguished character. But she was never destined to learn what effect the appearance produced, for the letter, like those it sought to excuse, remained unanswered. End of Part One of the Letters Chapter 10 in Tales of Men and Ghosts by Edith Wharton